Good morning. You may be seated. Well, I am thankful to see you all this morning. Um, it sounds like we said the word school and everybody disappeared. Um, that, it's supposed to have the opposite effect. Um, but in all honesty, we are so thankful that all of you are here to worship together. Um, as we begin our worship, there are some announcements that I do want to bring to your attention. Um, one of them you may have seen as you were walking in, and that's the photo booth in the Narthex. Um, one of the things that has been, I think, a tradition for most families for many, many years is that you get a picture of a child or family together on the first day of school. Well, we want as a church family to get pictures together. And while that may sound kind of, um, I don't know, weird, I think it's great because these will be pictures that you will be able to go back and look at and appreciate. If you don't wanna take pictures by yourself, I love to cheese in a camera, so you just grab me and I will come and I will stand with you, but please do stop by. Um, and see Jay and his wife and they would be happy to show you how that works and it comes out as just a photo film strip so you'll get about four photos. We also want to ask you to please make sure to sign the friendship rosters that are located in each one of the pews and if you have any information that needs to be updated please do that um, today. Today we are celebrating our students teachers, administrators, faculty, staff, and parents with a special blessing and prayer uh, as everyone is gearing up to go back to school. I know we have one school in our area that has already started um, and our others are gonna be gearing up this week. And so we will pray together as a church family, but we encourage you to also pray as individuals throughout the week. You'll notice that there are several um, inserts in your bulletin. One of them is for the Covenant Discipleship Groups. We are going to be working to help each of you get involved in a small group, a small Covenant Discipleship Group. And we are very grateful that Paula Stover has found a great passion uh, for this type of ministry. And so she is heading this ministry up for us. So if you would, read over that insert. If you have uh, any questions, please contact her, but know that there will be more information in the weeks to follow that will be in your bulletin and weekly update and in your trumpeteer. In addition to the Covenant Discipleship Groups, we're going to have a women's Bible study on Thursdays from 6.30 until 8. It's going to be based on uh, Beth Moore's study, Entrusted which is from 2 Timothy. Um, and Beth Abrazino is actually going to be facilitating that Bible study for us. If you're interested, please contact the church office and there will be forms that you can fill out to show your interest in that. Last two things. There is a prayer calendar that you will find in your bulletin as an insert. It has no dates on it, but it lists 31 ways that we as individuals and as a church can pray for our schools, our kids, our youth, our teachers, administrators, staff, and parents. Please take time to put this in a place that you will be able to see it each time you sit down for your quiet time of prayer so that you can include these in your prayers. And today from 3.30 until 4.45, all children are invited to the Back to School Bash and then from five to seven, our youth are invited to their back to school bash. It'll be in the Williams Bryce Center. And we are set to have a lot of fun and a lot of fellowship. So if you know of a child or a youth, have them come and join us. Uh, feel free to come and join us if you'd like to. That's a lot to take in, but it's important to know that there are many ways that you can be involved in the life of this church and we hope that you will find your place or places. If you would please, let us now stand together and to offer one another signs of peace, the peace of Christ. Would you please join me?
You may be seated. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and dwell among us. Inspire our hearts to praise. Inspire our lips to proclaim. Inspire us, O Lord, to be your disciples, to recognize those gifts you have given us, and to share them with the world. Be with us in this worship that we might encounter you and never be the same. We love you and we are thankful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now you may stand as we sing together our next song. This morning we are going to be uh, finishing up this sermon series that Joseph started with Ephesians and today we're going to be looking at Ephesians the fourth chapter verses 11 through 16 and during this time that we have been studying Ephesians we've been talking about discipleship we've been talking about unity and gifts and our purpose and so today I hope that as listening. 
I hope that as we uh, go through this scripture and as we hear God's word, uh, that we will receive that which we need in order to be equipped to share in the world. Our scripture comes from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 11 through 16. The gifts he gave, talking about God, the gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking love, truth in love, we must grow. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Let us pray. Oh God, we believe. We believe that your word is truth. And so as we have read your word and as we, Lord, study your word, we pray that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive, that we might be transformed by your living word. Amen. Uh, as everyone is getting ready to return to school or those who have returned to school, I have friends and family members whose children have already started to return. And so the pictures on social media have begun, the, the first day of school pictures. And I absolutely love looking at those. Uh, but my cousin Marnie, she recently posted a picture of her daughter, Addison, who will be a sophomore in high school this year. And I was immediately taken back to the baby shower I went to for Marnie when she was pregnant with Addison probably 15 years ago. And although I'm sure that I attended baby showers at least one or two before then, this is really the first one that I remembered. It was a nice shower, there were beautiful decorations, the food was great, there were beautiful gifts, and like most baby showers, there were some games that we were to play. Well, the winners of those games, there was a table that had the winner's gifts. So if you won, you got a gift. Being the competitive person that I am, I thought I'm taking home all of those. Well, I walked away the winner of two of them. As I unwrapped those gifts, I suddenly noticed that I was the new owner of baby wipes and baby bottles and onesies and baby socks. Now don't get me wrong, I understand that I was at a baby shower, but what in the world was I supposed to do with wipes and onesies and socks that fit my big toe. Um, my mom, who was sitting next to me, noticed my look of confusion, and so she leaned over to tell me that I needed to offer those gifts to Marnie. <laughs> what? But I'm the one who won. <laughs> Why would she get the gifts? And then mom went on to explain the rules of I don't know if it's every baby shower, but at least that baby shower rule of gifts. And that means that all of the gifts are for the mother-to-be. 
<laughs> well, I did give Marnie the gifts, and it was actually pretty neat to see just how excited she got about gifts I didn't even have to buy. <laughs> I thought about that baby shower when Marnie posted a picture of Addison so grown up. And I thought about the gifts that I won only to give away as I prepared for today's sermon. Our scripture this morning starts off by talking about gifts that God gives. Ephesians 4, verse 11, where we started, it tells us that God gives individuals gifts. Gifts to individuals in the body. Capital B. And usually when we receive a gift, we are the one who benefits, right? Well, unless you go to a baby shower or we're reading Ephesians 4, 11. The gifts that God gives are not just for the individual who receives the gift. God gives particular people particular gifts for the church, for the building up of the body. This means that the spiritual gifts of the person next to you or in front of you or behind you, it's not just God's gift to them. It's God's gift to us. Back to the baby shower. I may not have taken home the gifts that I won, but I did take home the gift of joy. Knowing that by sharing the gifts that I'd won, they were going to be appreciated and utilized by Marnie and eventually Addison. Ephesians 4.11 is definitely not a comprehensive list of spiritual gifts. You find a more comprehensive list in 1 Corinthians 12. This verse today focuses more on the gifts of church leadership. Those who ultimately are to help the members of the body make the most of their spiritual gifts. So it tells us that God gave the apostles. The word apostle in the New Testament was used overwhelmingly when talking about the 12 disciples and a few others who were given this very special designation, like the apostle Paul and a few others who were often found with Jesus. It tells us that God gave the prophets the prophets were those gifted in proclaiming the truth. Once or twice in Acts, prophets tell the future, but the majority of the time, like the prophets in the Old Testament, their time was spent forth-telling, not foretelling. Forth-telling, as in telling the truth, as opposed to foretelling, which was to tell the future. It's a common misconception about the gift of prophecy that it's all about telling the future. But that's really just a small portion of what we see in the Old Testament prophets and especially those that we see in the New Testament. Those gifted with prophecy are gifted in telling and explaining the truth of God's word tells us God gave us evangelists, or God gave evangelists. What we know about this gift is that it's not just a gift in sharing the gospel, but more so a gift in proclaiming the gospel to different groups, almost like missionaries or, or even itinerant preachers, at least in the early church. And then it tells us, the scripture tells us that God gave pastors and teachers Pastor describes the personal involvement with people while teacher describes the means by which his or her ministry to the people is carried out. This doesn't mean that every person called to the ministry is equipped 
to be 50% pastor or 50% teacher. I'll be honest with you, I've encountered a couple of spiritual giants as I have been in the Methodist church who I would say are 100% pastor and 100% teacher. But the reality is that most have a combination of the two. Of all the New Testament lists of God-given gifts, this one, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. This may be the one that most Christians may recognize. The problem is far fewer Christians see themselves in any of these particular descriptions. But the author of Ephesians did not say God gives only these gifts. Rather, God meant for these gifts, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, as a way to equip all God's people of the divine work of serving and building up the body of Christ. To me, it is a sobering thought that God decided to use individual people in the church to build up the church. It is a sobering thought that there are spiritual gifts right here in this church that haven't yet been used for the building up of the body. Here's the problem with that. God gave us these gifts, and God gave each of us certain abilities. And when we hold back for whatever reason, we're holding back a gift that God gave to us personally, yes, but a gift that is not just for you or for me. It is for us. It is for the body of Christ. These gifts, these responsibilities, these privileges, these opportunities to share God's amazing, incredible gift-giving abilities, it's about spiritual maturity and it's about growing in faith. Are we as Christians maturing? Are we growing spiritually? By God's grace and the Spirit's moving, are we looking and thinking and acting more like Jesus? The question's not, are we growing in numbers? But I'll tell you the secret to that. If we're maturing, we will. Nor is the question, do we have ministries for every single life phase there could possibly be? Or do we have lots of programs and schedules that make us a busy church? No, believe it or not, it's much, much more simple than that. Are we reflecting the life of Christ more and more? Are we pursuing holiness? Are we growing in godliness? Are we making disciples like Jesus did? Which is a huge part of maturing and becoming like Jesus. Are we as Christians maturing? This is the ultimate evaluation question for whether or not we are a healthy church. This perfecting of the saints, the maturing of Christians that the leaders in particular are to faithfully pursue, it is not a goal in and of itself. At least it's not the only goal. The purpose of equipping the saints purpose of perfecting believers, it's so that each of us might do the work of ministry. Not just one, not just two, not just those that have gone to seminary, but that each one of us would do the work of ministry. Every single person here, and even those who are not here today, we are in the business of ministry. The question is, how many of us take that job seriously? In a very real sense, I 
am called to minister no more than you are called to minister. I'm called to follow Christ no more than you are follow, called to follow Christ. I'm called to use my gifts for the church no more than you are called to use your gifts for the church. And do not get me wrong, when I say church, it's not just Trinity, it is the church universal. It is the body of Christ. Now hear me on this, I'm not downplaying my role or, or Joseph's role. I'm just hoping that you see the significance of your role in ministry. The importance of you maturing in Christ so that you might help others to mature in Christ. We all, in using our gifts, were called to serve and to help each other, to grow. It took me several years to discover exactly where and how God could best use the gifts that God gave me. But through the process of discernment, and some of you have heard this before, through the flipping of a quarter, <laughs> and through the equipping of some of my spiritual giants and mentors in my life, I realized that God gave me gifts that call for me to help equip the saints for ministry. My job and, and Joseph's job, it is to help you to mature as you help us to mature and to use these gifts to help in the maturing of the spiritual lives of all those around us. Some are called to the ministry of the ordained. Some are called to licensed ministry. Others are called to the ministry of the laity. But hear this, we are all called to ministry. We can't limit ministry to those who have it as their full-time vocation and to those who might have a seminary degree and those who might have even the REV in front of their name. Doing that hinders the spread of the gospel in our church, in our community, and throughout the world. Real growth in the body of Jesus Christ, it happens when we're all being perfected, and when we're maturing, and when we're all doing the work of ministry. In other words, the job of pastors, teachers, and other ministers is to equip, prepare, and train believers so that they can learn to function in their own ministries. This is the scriptural basis for the restructuring of my job and my vocation, but my calling here at Trinity. It was not so that everything seemed to fit under one umbrella, it was so that I would be in a place where I could help to equip you, along with Joseph, along with the church leadership, to discover your gifts, to know your gift, to know about your gifts, and then to plug those gifts in, whether it be in the ministries of this church or the ministries of our community. It is for the building up of the body of Christ. This is the way that the church will be built up not by the leaders doing everything themselves. And I'm still learning this. It's a difficult one for me, but I'm still learning this. It's by leaders equipping each person to function in your own ministries. The work of ministry doesn't belong to just those that have the REV, but it is for us all. I believe that the writer of Ephesians is pleading for Christians, for those of Ephesus, to move beyond infatuation and to move to a more mature level of commitment. Infatuation can be fickle, it can be erratic, it can be fragile, it can be jealous and unpredictable and defensive and easily 
threatened. The writer of Ephesians says it's time to live a steady, faithful life in Christ, to work in harmony with others toward a shared purpose so that the community would be strengthened and so that the body of Christ would be built up. So I'm asking you, I'm asking that you join Joseph and I as we prayerfully discern, am I using what God has given me in the very best possible way? Are you using what God gave you in the very best possible way? Christian vocation is not a career. It's not an occupation. It is an ongoing and an outward expression of who we are. It's an outward expression of who God created us and equipped us to be. All of us are gifted. All of us are gifted. All of us are called. All of us have opportunities to discern and to do the will of God. There's no such thing as a passive disciple. The more fully that we embrace and live into our discipleship, the more of ourselves we can give to God. And trust me, God will use everything that we choose to give back. There's no end to God's abundant grace and no end to God's desire for us to serve God by giving others our gifts. To reach new people, to spread the gospel, to strengthen and revitalize ministries, to serve the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. It requires effective leadership, leadership that I promise you, I, will be working on in this new and exciting phase of ministry. I know that it is a sacred task to raise up a new generation of spiritually grounded, well-equipped, God-gifted leadership for the building up of the body. And I invite you to join me in that, to become the church God wants us to be. We need to discover, develop, and employ. We need to know that the job belongs to us all. It's everyone's responsibility. And so over the next several months and throughout the next year, Joseph and I are going to be working to help each of you to discover your gifts, to take time to celebrate those gifts and to equip you as saints in the ministry to share those God-given gifts with everyone you encounter. Look around, pray, seek the gifts you and others possess, and wherever you find the fingerprints of God's Holy Spirit, offer affirmation and invitation. We are not simply believers. We are not simply followers. We are ministers, all of us, one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.
affirm our faith together by offering the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, but if you will allow me a moment of privilege, I'm going to change up the last bit of the order of worship. If I could have any students from 99 or above to below, all below, any students that are going back or have gone back to school, if you would come to the center aisle, please. Any parents, any teachers, faculty, staff, administrators, if y'all would come to the center aisle, please, and join me. And then what I'm going to ask others of you to do is to come to the aisle part of your pew so that you might be able to reach out and to touch the shoulder of someone in the center pews. This morning, we want to offer a special blessing and a prayer for all those who are going to be uh, heading back to school or have headed back to school. And we want to uh, let you know that we are praying for you, not just today, but in the days to come. And we pray that God would use you and the gifts that God has given you to increase the knowledge of God throughout the world. Um, if you would, let's scooch a little bit. I know this is different. Thank you for rolling with it. Um, and y'all come a little closer. And if you would, uh, let's just, let's touch the shoulder uh, or the back of someone um, so that we can be connected. And I'll offer a prayer at this time. God of all grace and lover of all things, we bow our hearts before you in praise and thanksgiving. Your word tells us in the Gospel of Mark that whoever welcomes a child in your name welcomes you. And Lord, as we begin a new school year, we welcome all children of all ages in your name. We know that you will walk with our students. You always do. As you walk with them, we humbly ask that you would whisper to them that which they need to hear when we are not there to whisper it and reassure them that they are not alone when we're not there to offer a shoulder on which to lean. We humbly ask that you would cover every school with the protection that only you can provide and keep hatred, harm, and violence far away. Make each student's mind strong and ready to learn Help them understand that hard work honors you, the one who created them. Teach them to be kind and unselfish, to love and respect all, and to love and respect those who are different from them. Give each the strength to respect authority so as not to rebel against correction, Give them courage to speak out for what is right, even when it is unpopular. And comfort those prone to loneliness and depression and provide someone who will take an interest in them. Be with those whose homes contain unhealthy relationships and provide them with friends, teachers, and administrators, faculty, and staff who will give godly counsel, healthy friendships, and compassionate presence and a healing spirit. Guide the adults within our schools as you give them patience, wisdom, patience, creativity, and even more patience. Bless them in and for their efforts. Give them a heart to love every student and peer that walks through the doors of our schools. Support the parents of our students. Give patience and wisdom to those who serve as afternoon tutors to their own children. Provide safe travel for those carrying students to and from school. 
provide a kindness in the car lines, and at the end of each day impress upon us all the importance of our homes as safe havens and give us the desire to create such sacred a space so that as you point us back toward home, we might all continue to be loved and lifted up. Oh God, it is your word that tells us to train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not part from it. Oh God, make it so. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And I would invite our ushers to come forward to receive the plates as we offer God his tithe and our offering. and our parents and teachers and faculty, staff and administrators. But we also want to lift up those who are in need of prayers of healing and guidance and wisdom. Um, Sandy, we will be praying for Dix 
As he prepares for his procedure on, on Friday, he'll be having a heart cath. Can I say that? <laughs> I did. Um, so please keep uh, Dick's in your prayers. Are there others that you would like to lift up as we join together in prayer today? Matthew, also my brother Dick Nelson, if you remember his mm -hmm. uh, in Guatemala on a mission trip to live in Guatemala. Wonderful. Many of you remember Dick and Allison Nelson who worshiped with us in the 845 service. That's Sandy's brother and sister-in-law and, and Dick is in Guatemala for a mission trip. So we will pray for safety for he and the team. We want to uh, lift up Ellie Riggs, um, who is Paul Riggs' mother who uh, suffered a heart attack last week. She had a triple Yep, triple bypass on Friday, and she's doing well from that, but continued prayers of healing. We'll talk, but Miss Louise, we will continue to remember you in our prayers. Let us go to God in prayer. God of grace, God of mercy, God of love, you are good and you make good of all things. We come as people in need of all those things, your love and power and grace and mercy and your compassion. Forgive us for how attached we have become to this world and the things within, and forgive us for the ways we all too often keep you at arm's length. We confess, O oh Lord, that we need you, not just today in this moment, but every moment of every day. We need you and the promise of hope that you give, the promise of good things to come. We pray for those who are sick, those who are weak, and those who are facing surgery and procedures. Be with Dick's be with Louise. Allow them to feel your Holy Spirit with them and in doing so, provide them comfort. We pray for those who are grieving, grieving the death of a loved one. Hold them in your gentle arms and provide healing of hearts and souls as they miss the physical presence of a life that has left an eternal mark. Thank you for the healing that you've provided to countless individuals. We ask that you continue to heal all who are in need in body, in mind, and spirit. We pray for our congregation and for the ministries of this, your church. Be our very reason for living and being and grant us a vision that reaches beyond these walls, this town, this world, one that embraces eternity with a calm confidence. Forgive us when we complain instead of praise. Open our eyes to the blessings you shower upon us. Open our mouths to share those blessings with others. Forgive us for making too much of ourselves and too little of you. Guide us to walk with the same humility that your son, Jesus, modeled for us. Remind us we are one body in need of all its parts, people whom you have called together to be your witnesses in the world. Empower us to discover our gifts, to perfect them in your love, and to share them with the world so that you and you alone would be glorified. And now hear us as we pray together with one voice, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together our final hymn.
prepared to leave this place, I encourage you to please do stop and get some pictures. Please do stop and get a yard sign to let not just our kids in this church, but kids throughout our community, students of all ages know that Trinity is praying for them this school year. And as you go and as you do these things and as you go into the world, remember that you are called to be in ministry. You have been given gifts that only you can share. Ask God to show you where and come along for the ride because it is a beautiful, wonderful journey that was meant to be taken together. So go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.